Thank you. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago. And as you're turning there, I do hope that uh, you have actually been passing out those brochures that have been in your bulletin each week for the Dean Bergen Society meetings. Um, can I have a show of hands? How many have passed out at least one? Oh, four people. Well, that's good. That's not as good as I hope, but the brochures are available. Folks, we have a special event coming up here. We have people literally coming from all over the world. We have people come from coming from South America. We have people coming from Great Britain. We have people coming from Europe, uh, people coming from Canada, and of course all over the United States. And we are the host church. So we encourage you, please participate with us. This is not a difficult thing to do. Just take the brochure that you find in your bulletin for the upcoming meetings for the Dean Bergen Society. You know somebody, at least one person, that you can give that to. And so I encourage you, please take those home and don't leave them at home. Think of somebody that you can give it to and you don't even have to say much. Just say, hey, we're having a special event at our church. Here, I'd like to invite you and give them a copy of that brochure. I think you'll find that that is not only something that you will be encouraged to do, um, a blessing to you, but I think, I think someday God is going to reward you for at least making a little bit of an effort to try to bring somebody to the church. Who knows, maybe they'll come and they'll say, man, why don't we come to services here? This would be a nice place to go to church. So, a word to the wise. Someday you will stand before Jesus and you will give an account for what you've done. And I hope that you do that and I hope that you pass out tracts every week. Somebody that does not know the gospel needs to hear it and it's somebody that you will come in contact with this week. Did you know I think every one of us comes in contact every week with somebody who doesn't know Jesus Christ. Even when I was in China, I had opportunities to share Christ with young people who didn't know him. I spoke at 16 different classes, and then afterwards, young people would come up and talk to me, and other young people that my friends know, and I had opportunity to share in a very hostile context. You have a very non-hostile context. I hope that you are doing something with what God has given to you. You will give an account. You will give an account. I hope you're doing something with what you've got. Now, to our text today. We're over in Exodus chapter 13, and we're looking at verses 1 through 16. Now, we've had a, a bit of a break from the last time we were there. The last time we talked about sanctifying the firstborn, part 3 was back on May 15th. So that's a month ago, more than a month ago. May 22nd was Elder Dan Swain. He was talking about serving shadows, the heart of idolatry from 1 Corinthians 10. May 29th was Reverend Stephen Ricker, the missionary gospel that makes us fishers of men, Mark 1, 14 through 22. June 5th, Reverend Keith Coleman, Holy, Holy, Holy from Isaiah 6, 1 through 8, a fantastic passage. June 12th was Reverend Chris Sidwell, the song of the saints in heaven from Revelation 5, 8 through 13 and 15, 1 through 4. And then, of course, last week, our own Elder Keith McCoy, the Everlasting Father from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, for Father's Day. And so today, we're on part 4 of Sanctify, the firstborn out of Exodus chapter 13, verses 1 through 16. So we've been gone for five weeks. So let me give you a very quick review of the key points that we've covered so far about sanctification and the firstborn. The doctrine of sanctification is one of the most important doctrines in Scripture. Salvation, of course, is key in terms of man. <laughs> Getting to heaven, if you don't make it there, you might as well forget everything else. But sanctification stands second in line in terms of the application of the truth of the gospel of Christ, who is the heart of Scripture. Sanctification is what God wants to do with you right now, in present time, while you're still alive here on earth. Sanctification will be ultimate when we get to heaven, but right now God is working a work in my life 
and I hope in yours. He is conforming us to the image of Christ. Sanctification in this life does not mean becoming sinlessly holy, perfect, so that you no longer commit any acts of criminal offense against the holiness of God. But it is a process through which you are going right now. Are you responding to what God is doing in your life to conform you to the image of Christ? Or are you merely sitting and enjoying the sunshine? Fooling around with the time that you've got, enjoying your video games, enjoying your TV programs, enjoying your sports events, enjoying your relaxation and your time off, enjoying your retirement, or are you growing in Christ? Sanctification. God sets some principles for us that we find throughout the entire Bible as we look at this sanctification of the firstborn, how the firstborn belong to God. We saw there was in the Old Testament a very striking emphasis on the firstborn. The firstborn was the beginning of the strength of a man's family. We saw that in the prophetic words of Jacob on his deathbed and later in the specific laws related to the children born of more than one wife. Even if it was born to a hated wife, the firstborn still had the rights of the firstborn. Whether you're a firstborn male or female, you're the beginning of your father's strength. There are at least three families in this church that have only daughters. And my firstborn was also a daughter. But what about those families that have no firstborn sons? Under the Old Testament law for daughters also received a blessing and the inheritance of the firstborn when there were no sons in the family. So a lot of responsibility rests on the shoulders of the firstborn child of every family. We saw that God made that point when he divided up the land of an inheritance to Israel because there was a man by the name of Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, who had no sons but only daughters. The names of his daughters were Mala, Noah, Hogla, Mikla, and Tirzah. And God said that they were to receive an inheritance even though there were no sons. And as we noted, that was what was given. In fact, it was the very last thing that was commanded, not merely given. The very last thing that was commanded by God to Moses before he told Moses to climb the mountain to see the promised land and to die before Israel entered in. When God says something the first time and when God says something the last time, we need to pay attention. And this is clearly one of those things. It emphasizes the point of the privilege and responsibility. We saw that the daughters of Lapha had, after that, were mentioned six more times in Numbers, Joshua, and First Chronicles, because God was making a point about the responsibility of young women as well as young men. Firstborn daughters also had certain privileges, the first rite of marriage. We saw that in Genesis 29. The point of that was that daughters are valuable as well as sons in the eyes of God. And that's far different than all the pagan nations of the world. I've just been in China. There are 56 different people groups in China. I spent two days in Beijing going through a, an incredible park that was built for the 2008 Olympics that represents all 56 ethnic groups, all 56 ethnic cultures in China. And it is amazing how different they are. Their architecture is different. Their customs are different. Their clothing is different. We saw many of them performing their traditional dances, dressed in their clothing, singing their music, playing their very strange to us instruments. And as you go through this park, every area that's set aside for each of the 56 different groups is completely different. But the emphasis is always on the boys, not the girls. God says the girls are important too. So young ladies, don't forget that. From God's perspective, you are valuable. From God's perspective, you are important. From God's perspective, you had great worth in his sight. The term firstborn we saw is found exactly 100 times in the King James Bible. Only seven of those occurrences are found in the New Testament. So 93 are in the Old Testament. Six of those seven in the New Testament refer to Christ. Two refer to the physical firstborn son of Mary. Four refer to his position in relationship to God the Father as the one who is called the firstborn of the Father. Only one relates to the actual firstborn slain or redeemed at the first Passover. 
Now, I think it's rather significant that six out of the seven refer to Jesus himself, and one refers to the type or the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ when we get to the New Testament. The reason that's significant in the New Testament is because of all the wicked firstborn sons that are found in the Old Testament. Those wicked firstborn were all men who forfeited the rights of the inheritance of the firstborn. Jesus, the firstborn son, regained the rights of the inheritance by his death on the cross in payment for our sins, and he passed those rights on to us, whom the book of Hebrews calls his brethren. It's of interest that the very firstborn son in the Bible, Cain, is not called by the term firstborn, even though, in fact, he was the very firstborn. But he was a wicked son. In that same vein, it's significant to notice that the very first occurrence of the term firstborn in the Old Testament is used of a wicked son of a man that God cursed. Canaan, who's the father of the Canaanites, was the son of Ham. When Ham did his dastardly and distasteful and disgusting and filthy vile deed of seeing his father's nakedness and laughing about it, Noah did not curse Ham, he cursed Canaan, the son of Ham. As his own son had dishonored him, so the son of Ham would dishonor him and become the father of the Canaanites. We saw that over in Genesis chapter 9, verses 20 through 25. We're told about Canaan's descendants in chapter 10. We find that among those were Cush and Mishraim and Phut and Canaan. And Canaan bat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, the father of the Hittites. The Hittites were one of the most filthy ancient people that ever lived. I had a great deal of study about that when I lived in Israel. And then it talks about all oh, where the Canaanites are spread abroad. We saw that Reuben, the very firstborn son of Jacob, was also a wicked man. God removed the privilege of the firstborn from him because he committed incest with his father's wife. That was also a sin that's, by the way, cursed in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. That resulted in the permanent loss, permanent loss of the right of the firstborn when Jacob prophetically blessed each of the tribes that would descend from his sons. We saw that in Genesis chapter 49. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed. Then defilest thou it, he went up to my couch. People, God have, has a lot to say about sexual immorality. God curses it. When you commit sexual immorality, you may be forgiven, but you lose certain things that you can never get back again. It's very clear when we get to the book of Hebrews where the sin of Esau, where he scorned the right of his of firstborn, is compared with fornication. He didn't commit fornication, but that's what it's compared to. He lost the rights of the firstborn. He lost the blessing of God. He sought it Carefully, it says, with tears of repentance, but he couldn't get it back. Don't mess around with sex. Don't mess around with sex. God curses those who mess around with sex. Dear people, it's serious. We live in a society where people don't care. We live in a society where people tell you it's okay to do it. We live in a society where you're laughed at and scorned if you're still a virgin by the time you get to be 20 years old. Where people put pressure on you and tell you what's wrong with you. No, there's nothing wrong with you. If you're standing for truth, for morality, for righteousness, for holiness, your body as a Christian is the temple of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God dwells in you. Paul says, shall I take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? Because, quoting Genesis, he says, don't you realize the two become one flesh? In sexual intercourse, there is a bond that is formed 
that is broken only by death. People give all kinds of reasons for divorce and all kinds of reasons why it's okay to do this and that and the other thing and it doesn't make any difference. God says, every time you have sex, you're forming a bond that is broken only by death. Dear people, that's a serious issue. There are many bigamists, many polygamists, many polyandrists, more than one husband, running around who don't take the responsibility for the many that they've joined themselves to. I'm preaching bluntly because that's what we see here is going on because God has special blessings for the morally pure relationship between a man and a woman and their godly seed after them. God's design is to raise up a godly seed. Reuben. He lost the rights of the firstborn. He was cursed when the eternal blessings were passed out to the tribes. A clear illustration in the Old Testament how blessings and inheritance can be lost even while still remaining part of God's chosen people. You don't lose your salvation. You're still part of God's chosen people. But you can lose your blessing and you can lose your inheritance. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 17. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fall, fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. If you don't take advantage of God's grace, bitterness is going to spring up, and you're going to fall into the same sin as Esau. It says so in the next verse. Be very careful when you allow bitterness to grow in your heart. Oh, we can pass it off as all kinds of other things. Well, I'm upset. Or, well, he did me wrong. Hmm. And I'm just going to fume about it. Your people, what you're doing is you're allowing a root of bitterness to spring up. It'll not only trouble you, but you will defile many other people by it as well. Because that's the illustration he gives in verse 16. Next verse. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Fornication, sexual immorality, is compared to what Esau did by selling out his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he lost a blessing. He was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Sexual immorality is given as an illustration of something that you can do that can never be undone. An act that has permanent consequences no matter how hard you want to reverse it. In this case, it was true even with one who was a slave. You lose something. You lose blessing. You can never regain it. Young people, older people, keep yourselves pure. Back to Reuben, the firstborn who lost the blessing. Reuben later tried to make amends by rescuing his brother Joseph from being murdered. A very commendable deed, but Joseph was sold as a slave when Reuben was not around. It was Reuben who had the tender conscience when the brothers stood before Joseph, whom they did not recognize in Egypt. Reuben still had this going back years. He still had a wounded conscience about what had happened to Joseph. Reuben, the one who committed incest with his father's wife. Reuben even offered his two sons to be killed if he didn't bring Benjamin back to his father on the second trip to Egypt. Reuben has a lot of commendable, commendable traits about him. Remember, sin has temporal consequences for the believer even when we are forgiven. You remember Reuben's rescue attempt back in Genesis 37? Reuben heard it and he delivered him out of their hands, speaking of Joseph, and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand on him. Now listen to this, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. Reuben was a good guy. But when the blessings were passed out in Genesis 49, he lost the right of the firstborn, he lost the double inheritance, he lost the patriarchal blessing. He was a good guy. We find him again when he's talking in front of Joseph. 
and didn't know that Joseph could understand because Joseph had not yet revealed himself to his brothers. In Genesis 42, verse 22, Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and you would not hear? Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. Reuben understood there were consequences. He still has this guilt on his conscience. There are temporal consequences for sin. Never forget that. You can still be saved. You can still grow in Christ. You can still be on your way to heaven, but you will suffer temporal, that is, consequences in time, temporal consequences here and now when you sin. Don't treat sin lightly. God doesn't. Someday we will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ to give an account for everything that we've done in this body. In this body. Your thoughts, your words, your actions, your attitudes, your motivations, my thoughts, my words, my actions, my attitudes, my motivations, I will give an account for them. That makes me sweat, cold sweat, as I look back over my life. There are tears in heaven, folks. Read about it in the book of Revelation. If you read that carefully, you'll discover the tears are not wiped away until after the millennium. We're going to have the rapture. We're going to have the wedding feast of the Lamb while the tribulation is going on here on earth. We're going to come back riding white horses with Christ at the second coming. We're going to be there when he judges the nations, when he casts Satan into the bottomless pit, binds him for a thousand years. We're going to rule with Christ a thousand years. But the tears don't all get wiped away until the end of the millennium and we have the new heaven and the new earth. Things we could have done that we didn't. Things that we did that we shouldn't have done. Rewards that we have lost because we were slothful sluggards. I saw another film at one time called Eddie the Eagle. It's about Eddie Edwards, who was a man from Great Britain. When he was little, he was, his legs were in braces. He couldn't walk. And um, Eddie, as a little child, wanted to go to the Olympics. He didn't know in what sport. He just knew he wanted to do it. But he could hardly even walk. But over the years, that was one of his goals. His father was a plasterer in England. That is, he plastered walls, like these walls here. They've got plaster on them, lath and plaster. But he was determined to go to the Olympics. And he did everything he possibly could. And one day, a comment that his father made made him think, Winter Olympics, so he wanted to learn how to ski. And he was pretty terrible at it. And then, he went and talked to the Olympic Committee and they said, well, we're sorry, but you can't come. So he thought, what Winter Olympic sport is there that I could possibly do that Great Britain doesn't enter? And it was the ski jump. Now, for a kid who started out not being able to walk or walking only with braces, that sounds like an impossible goal. But he fixed his eyes on the goal. And he never, never, never gave up. And it's an incredible story about how he tried to learn how to ski jump and nobody would teach him. And Great Britain had not had a ski jump for something like 20 years under the Olympics. But he was determined to learn how to do it. And he took all the money that he had saved from working and he went to Germany where there was a, a practice slope and he found a guy who had been on the Olympic team who was a drunkard and only running a ski plow, but the guy had been on an Olympic jumping team from the United States years before. And he decided he wanted to get that guy for his coach, and the guy just laughed at him. I won't tell you the whole story, but through a, a series of incredible events, that guy finally see, realized, this kid has what I didn't have. I was a natural at it. I could jump and nobody could touch me. 
But I had no drive, no determination. I spent all my time running after women, drinking liquor, until finally the coach kicked me off the team. So he began to work with that boy. There was a distance that had to be jumped, 61 meters, to be able to qualify. Eddie Edwards just barely made it. But that wasn't anywhere near world-class jumping, but it was a new British record because the British did not enter ski jumping. So they sent him to the Olympics, 1988. And when he was there, he jumped. A new record for Britain. He didn't win anything else, but they called him Eddie the Eagle. He had fallen down so many times, he was all beat up. He had scars and bruises and cuts all over him. But he was determined to do his best. How many Christians do you know? Are you one of them who is determined to do his best, her best for Jesus? Or do you approach this life as a sloth, just sort of bumming your way through it? I came in contact with some Christians who were willing to lay down their life for Jesus. Every day, they face arrests. Every day, they face police interrogation. And they have nothing. But they give everything for Jesus. Dear people, what will it take to transform us? To change us, to energize us, to empower us to move forward for Jesus, not for the flesh. There's a lesson in all these things that we've been talking about, looking at Reuben and others here who are firstborn sons who are wicked. A lesson to be learned. The world, the flesh, and the devil often make their greatest attacks against the firstborn. Because, you see, the firstborn is the strength of the father, is the responsibility of carrying on a godly heritage to the next generation. But like there is blessing to the firstborn daughter, there's also examples of wicked firstborn daughters. We glance just briefly at the wickedness of the firstborn daughter of Lot. Lot has fled from Sodom. His wife has looked back and been turned to a pillar of salt. He has his two daughters with him. They go and live in a cave. The firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. And they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down nor when she arose. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in, and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And the firstborn bare a son, and called his name Moab. The second is the father of the Moabites unto this day. The younger daughter bore Ammon, the father of the Ammonites. Both were the enemies of Israel in later generations. Another lesson to be learned here. You know, I, I hear so many people talk about the rights of Christians to drink. And they have all kinds of arguments. They won't go over their silly arguments. Because the point is not what are your rights. The question is what are your responsibilities? When you teach your children, you don't need to teach them their rights to drink. What you need to teach them is wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Wine is deceitful, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby, now listen to the last three words, is not wise. Who cares what your rights are? What your interest should be, should be wisdom. Whosoever is deceived by wine and strong drink is not wise. 
You don't have to teach your kids their rights. The world's going to push them toward what they call their rights because the world uses it for seduction. 95% of all first-time seductions involve alcohol. 95% of all first-time seductions involve alcohol. Did you get it? 95% of all first-time seductions involve alcohol. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Do you want to live a morally pure life? Do you want to live a life that is pleasing to God? Do you want to live a life that does not step over the line? Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging. Whosoever deceived thereby is not wise. I don't care about the arguments of rights. The issue is wisdom. I wanted to teach my children wisdom. Not all the arguments for what their rights are and whether Jesus drank alcoholic wine or not. When Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he doesn't even use the word wine. He uses the word the cup. Do you know what the bread and the wine, 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 speak of? The bread and the cup. Do you know what they speak of? The body and blood of Christ. When God gives us symbols, and I've really gotten off the topic here, but I'm going to preach it anyway. God gives us symbols. He gives us symbols that are true. Symbols that have meaning. We've been talking about the unleavened bread. That's in our text today. Why was it unleavened? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Leaven is a picture and a type of sin. So we eat the unleavened bread of Passover and he says, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Jesus Christ had no sin. It says so three times in the New Testament. He died for our sins, he bore our sins, but he himself was sinless. The unleavened bread speaks of the body of Christ. He is without sin. That's why God instituted unleavened bread at Passover in the text that we're reading, chapters 12 and following of Exodus. Because it gives us a picture of the sinless body of Christ. What does the cup speak of? Paul tells us. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we read it every time we have the Lord's table here. It speaks of the blood of Christ. How does grape juice turn into wine? It's through a process called fermentation. It is a decay process a corrupting process. David tells us in the Psalms, Psalm 11, that his blood was not corrupted. Just like leaven with the bread, so the decay process, the corruption of the grape juice into wine would indicate that we have unfermented wine, if you will, new wine, fresh wine, that is grape juice, what we call, because corruption is not what Jesus experienced. I think there's stupid arguments that people use to say, well, Jesus drank real wine, so we can drink real wine. By that, they mean alcoholic fermented wine. People, God called us to wisdom. He didn't call us to try to figure out ways where we can imbibe with the world, where we can do the same things as the world, where we can fit in with the world. He called us to be a separate people. He called us to be a different people. He called us to be a distinct people. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. We find alcohol here. We find alcohol involved with Noah and the son of Ham. 
we find alcohol involved here with the firstborn of Lot and with the secondborn of Lot, where incest is going on, and where we have two nations that are produced that ultimately bring a curse upon the nation of Israel. Now, God does extend his grace even to those involved in those kinds of sin. We find Ruth, for example, was a Moabitess, and God reached down and saved her out of that pagan and filthy culture. We find Israel is called a firstborn son, and Israel gets involved in many wicked sins later on, but God still loves Israel. Israel is even involved in spiritual fornication and harlotry, and we find many of the prophets speaking against that. But God said to Moses, You shall say this unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. There is an emphasis on the firstborn, because the firstborn belongs to God. Dear people, we're his children. I hope you're doing with that what God has called you to do. Today we start some new material. Oh my, is it that late already? I can't believe it. I got two minutes. Okay, two minutes. Sanctifying the firstborn has some intense doctrinal implications for us. The doctrine of sanctification, the setting apart of some person for specific service to God, has three stages in the New Testament. So when we get to the New Testament, in the Old Testament we have all the typology, we have certain foundational statements, and we've looked at a few of those, but in the New Testament the doctrine of sanctification is developed to its fullest. And we find that there are three stages in the New Testament to sanctification. Number one is what's called positional sanctification. Number one is positional sanctification. Ephesians chapter one deals with positional sanctification. That is how God sees us in Christ. And if you read Ephesians chapter one, you'll see in him, in Christ, in the beloved, all the things that are ours because we are in Christ. We are positionally set apart in Jesus so that when God the Father looks at us, he looks at us through the lens of the Lord Jesus Christ and that's how he sees us. That's what's called positional sanctification. Number two, the second major area of sanctification developed in the New Testament is called progressive or practical sanctification. Progressive or practical sanctification. That is how God is transforming our lives into the image of Christ each day. God takes you as you are, but God does not leave you as you are. If you're truly saved, and this, by the way, is one of the tests is whether or not a person is saved. If you are truly saved, God is working in your life and there are some changes that are taking place in your life. And every time you resist the changes that God is trying to work in your life, he chastens you. Now, if you never experience the chastening hand of God, it means you are not saved. You can go to church. You can wear your nice clothes on Sunday. You can smile with a little plastic halo over your head, but you're not saved. Don't kid yourself. If no transformational process is taking place in your life, you are not saved. Paul says so in the book of Hebrews. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. It's a very clear teaching of the New Testament. If you can go on your wishy-washy way through life and never have any transformation taking place, you are not saved. If you can move through life and resist the will of God and not get spanked for it, you are not saved. 
because God transforms us by the renewing of our minds, that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Have you proved yourself that you are not reprobate? How do you know you're saved? What difference has it made in your life? What are you doing for Jesus Christ? Not yesterday, but today. Not 40 years ago, but today. Is there growth taking place? If not, God will prune you. Jesus said so in John chapter 15. He prunes you so that you will bring forth fruit. And that your fruit will remain. People, this is a serious issue after salvation. Sanctification. You're never going to reach sinless perfection in this life. But God will work on you. Because he's promised it. The Holy Spirit never overlooks any of the children of God. Each of us grow at different rates. Each of us have different responsibilities. Each of us have different gifts. But all of us will bear fruit if we're saved. Are you bearing fruit? If not, and if you're saved, you're about to be pruned. Because a good husbandman always prunes the vines and the branches so that they will bear fruit. Are you saved in resisting the will of God? If you're saved in resisting the will of God, look out, chastening is coming. You claim to be saved, but there's never been any change in your life. Wake up. You're lost. The third and final area of sanctification, and we'll talk about each of these in more detail, but the third and final area of sanctification is what's called ultimate sanctification. Ultimate sanctification sanctification. There will come someday a state of sinless perfection. But that only comes when we die and are present with the Lord in heaven. There's not going to be any sin in heaven. Only when you die and are present with the Lord in heaven. Ultimate sanctification is when we are released from our old sin nature, which is always attached to our body that is subject to death. That's why our bodies are subject to death. We have a sin nature and we also commit sins and omit things. So we have sins of commission and sins of omission. So we're piling on to that old dead nature all these sins. Now we have a new nature in Christ that has not gotten rid of our old nature. Paul talks about it. It's fighting with our new nature all the time. He says, man, the things that are, you know, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. Who will deliver me from this body of death? As long as we are here in these physical bodies and we don't have our resurrection bodies yet, the old sin nature is going to be fighting against the new nature. The regenerate nature. The nature that the Holy Spirit is developing in your life as you grow in Christ. So that whereas you used to do a lots of sin and just a little bit of things that please God, now it's a war that goes on and you're gaining territory and gaining territory and gaining ground. When I was in China, I went out to the Great Wall near Beijing. And um, it's 1,200 miles long. And no, I did not walk the whole thing, though I felt like I had after going about three or four miles on that. Uh, humongous on the top ridges of the mountain, up and down and up and down. Why did the emperors over several hundred years build that wall? It was to keep out the enemy, to keep out the invaders, to protect the land. Are you building walls in your life to keep out the enemy? When it was small, it kept out a few. When it got longer, it kept out more. When it got longer, it kept out more. When it got longer, it kept out more. You should be building a wall in your life to keep out the enemies, the world, the flesh, the devil, the demons, to drive them away, 
to make it hard for them to get there. The reason it's built on the top of mountain ridges is because the enemy would have to climb uphill before they got to the wall and be totally exhausted and then the defenders could shoot down while they're trying to shoot up. You know, I climbed 7,000 steps to get to one place and then 5,000 steps the other direction because we had a cable car. That's a lot of steps. Try it sometime. Up very steep inclines. Make it hard for the enemy. Don't lie down in the valley waiting for the enemy to attack you while you pop grapes into your mouth. Build walls. The world, the flesh, the devil, the demons. Don't let them have an influence in your life because you're living for Jesus every day, every moment of every day, every way, every attitude, every thought, every motive, every word, every action. Ultimate sanctification is when we're released from our old sin nature, which always is attached to our body that is subject to death. We'll have no sin nature in our intermediate state before the resurrection, and we will have no sin nature in our resurrected bodies. Well, that's all I'm going to be able to cover for today. We have a lot more to say about that. Important material. After salvation, make sure you're saved. If there's no change in your life, if there's no fruit in your life, if you never experience chastening, you are not saved. Make sure you're right with God. And then expect God, because he loves you, to bring you through that process that transforms you into the image of Christ. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. We pray that you will take it and use it as a surgeon's scalpel in our lives to excise all of the wickedness, all the things that we tolerate all the things that do not please you. Make us your people, united in heart and spirit, in fervent desire to serve Jesus Christ, in zeal and faithfulness and purity, that Jesus Christ would be seen in us not counting the cost, realizing that the temporal things of life will pass away. They're not important. It's only the things that last for eternity that count. Help us to keep our eyes on the goal. Help us to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Help us to consider him who endured such hardness of sinners against himself, lest we become wearied and faint in our minds. We have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Take your word, Father, as preached today. Use it in each of our lives that Jesus Christ would be glorified. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 611, He Hideth My Soul. We'll stand and sing all the verses, number 611. <laughs>